you're jumping back into the gap. I'll let the coach, it's either sideline, two on the side, three on the side. That's off the second cut. Lead the country in offensive rebound. Hey coach, welcome to the Basketball Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Oliver. Let's share the game. Hey coach, before we start the podcast, just wanted to let you know, on May 8th to 10th, I will be partnering with NBA shooting coach Dave Love to put on an exclusive basketball coaching retreat we are calling the Art of Coaching Retreat. In this limited enrollment retreat, Dave and I will share a proven concept that helped us both stimulate coaches from around the world. We will make this experience beneficial for coaches of all levels. The event will be held in beautiful, warm Palm Desert, California, Friday, May 8th to Sunday, May 10th. Go to basketball-retreat.eventbrite.com to get more information or DM me on Twitter or Instagram and I will send you the link. Enjoy the podcast. Coach, is awesome today to have Rick Croy with us. Coach Croy has uh, done an amazing job at California Baptist University. Since he took over in 2013, they've had 148 and 44 overall record. And then they went from, well, you coach, you went to Division II National Championships basically every year until you became a Division I program. And then what was remarkable is when you guys went Division I, you won 16 games, which as I understand it, is the most any team that's ever transitioned to Division I. And you're the only team ever to transition to Division One and play in the postseason tournament. You played in the CBI last year, and you're having a great year this year. So, Coach, thanks for taking the time. I appreciate you having me on. I'm a big fan of the podcast. Well, and I think so many coaches are going to be an even bigger fan of you when they learn so much of what you've accomplished already in your coaching career and you know some of the ideas that you share as well. And we're going to dive deep, but Maybe first, I think coaches would be very curious about transitioning a Division II program to a Division I program. Was there anything unique or different that had to happen to be able to evolve your program from the level, two different levels? Yeah, it's been a great challenge and one that our staff was really excited about. I had some unique experience that I was bringing forward with me in that I was at UC Riverside. It was really my, that's where I got my coaching start with John Macy. He's been an incredible mentor for me, but I started with him in in 1999 and UC Riverside at the time was a division two powerhouse and they were making the transition to division one basketball. So I got some great experience there. I didn't know that, you know, almost two decades later, I'd be using it as a head coach and and things were different then. When you transitioned from division two at that time, you weren't actually in a league or a conference. You played as kind of an independent it was very difficult to schedule games. They've made things better now for transitioning teams. And, and I think the NCAA can still do more. I don't necessarily think the teams making the transition should be ineligible for the tournament for four years like they are now. But hopefully that's something that we can help change and pioneer and, and help other schools that are doing it in the future. But it's been really good. You know, some of the things that areas that it's challenged us in is we've had to probably look a little bit further down the line. Some of our experiences of staff was, was coaching at the junior college level where obviously you, you coach your team and you try and build continuity, but oftentimes it's a reset every year. At Division Two. you can usually attract a really good player. Like if you're losing a good player, maybe you can go get another guy right off a transfer, grad transfer, or a Division One transfer where they come into Division Two and they're eligible immediately in. We knew that making this transition, we'd have to see things further down the line with more depth and really continue to build our continuity that way. But what we found is that if guys are great competitors, and I think we're seeing this across all levels of basketball, if a guy really knows how to compete, he can have success at any level. Because we've had some guys that I think people may have viewed as, yeah, hey, these guys were recruited as Division II players, but they've been great division one players because of their competitiveness and because they've continued to develop as players. And that's been really exciting for us. It's tremendous. And it's going to be a great, great segue into what we talk about, but just, just quickly, if you guys win your conference tournament this year, which is possible, you can't go to the NCAA tournament. Is that the rule? Correct. Right now we cannot play in our conference tournament, but that window will be up. You can't play. Okay. All right. I was wondering what would happen in that case. Yeah. (laughs) we can win the regular season conference and that's that's one of our goals now obviously that's a great challenge 
because the WAC basketball has improved so much from the time that we anticipated making this move. You know, our last few years at Division II, we were kind of watching things unfold. And at the time, the WAC was somewhere between 26, 27, and 28 in terms of power rankings as a conference. And last year as a conference, the WAC was dependent upon what metric or evaluation system between 13 and 15. So the conference has jumped up quite a bit and, you know, really, really competitive all the way throughout. And obviously with the Mexico State setting the gold standard in our conference, it, it's a great challenge. Yeah, no question. It's a great challenge. And one of my favorite quotes I read from you is this, this concept, figure out what you can be great at and create separation. So the question to you becomes, what have you figured out that helps you create separation at California Baptist? Yeah, that's, um, you know, something I've kind of learned along the way from all my mentors. And, you know, I really believe in finding great mentors and continuing to learn from them. And at, at the same time, I think you got to go out and learn from others. And every year we're trying to hunt the 1% and go meet with people on offense and defense and tweak things, whether it's ball screen coverage or recruiting promotional items or whatever it may be enhancing our facility you know you've got to continue to evolve and improve in every area but i also believe that you know you have to you have to kind of find within yourself what you think you can be great at and when you find that that's the area that you've got to try and find some separation in because as you know when you're competing it's so difficult to separate in any area so you know i encourage coaches when i speak at clinics or i meet with guys there've been so many help, people that have helped me along the way, I always try and encourage them to really find their area that they believe they can separate. And for us, that's kind of been team building. And you know, I got a head coaching job at a young age at Citrus College, and I really didn't know what we were going to do offensively. I had an idea of how we wanted to compete on the defensive end of the floor, but we put most of our energy into building our team and how we were going to go about it as a family and the toughness in our locker room our response when things are tough and that paid off for us. And we were able to build a unique culture at a level where I think most people from the outside looking in think that the JC level is full of guys that are out for their own and they're just hunting scholarships. And we had such a great experience at Citrus with our guys and had some of, some of my best memories in coaching were they, they came from my time at Citrus, and, and we continued in our five years there to just continue to try and improve upon our team building. And, and when we got the opportunity here at, at CBU, even though it was a different level, we felt like, gosh, let's stay with what we know and let's continue to try and separate that in that area. And I think anytime you, you really focus on it, it pays off. And that's, that's different for everyone. You know, I think when you coach in a conference and you compete against programs a few times a year, you can kind of see the areas that they're trying to create separation in. And, and for some coaches, they, they have incredible offensive minds or, you know, they really see the game from the defensive side of the ball. And for us, it's really been trying to build a culture of belief and confidence. And we've really enjoyed that. And one of the things that I know is really challenging, and you talked about being a young coach at a young age, is, is trusting your own work especially when it matters most. And, and you've said this before in a clinic. What does that mean for you? And what advice do you have for coaches in that regard? Well, we talk about this fairly often as a staff is that, you know, from when I started coaching in 99 until now, you have so much more access to what other people are doing. And as coaches, we all have, we all bring our own insecurities to the table and I think now with the access to information, sometimes those insecurities can become weaknesses because we look so much outside in rather than inside out. And we don't trust what we already know, even if some of those things are really, really simple. And, you know, for example, I, I think I think technology is great and we want to use technology in our program. But I come back to what inspired me and motivated me as a player. And, and when I played for Coach Frank Alaco, who's one of the great coaches. I played for him in high school, and I still remember this day, him handing out inspirational pieces of literature on paper. And I kept every single one of those. I still have those to this day. So we do that as a program. I mean, it may not come through their phones, and it may not come through their iPads, but you know, our guys hold on to those. We put them in their lockers, and 
that's one of those things where I believe in that. I believe for some of our guys that impacts their journey and it may get them to a better place that week or that day and, and all those things matter. And I think that translates even into coaching where maybe you have a passing drill that you've been using for years and years, but you know, you see a new one on Twitter or you go to a clinic and you see something that's more dynamic, but you know, I encourage people stay with what you know, believe in it. And I think when your guys feel that belief, I think you have a much better chance to get by. And when you soar with, with your own strengths, the guys really feel that. So I think for so many of us, how we came up in the game will always be true to us. And, and sometimes we just have to remember to be true to those things. Well, which is such a great point. And that's, that's the foundation for everything. But at the same time, you've mentioned this already. There's, there's tremendous value to seeking out things that can challenge you and can help you change and help you evolve. And clearly that's something that I try and do with coaches to help them understand some of the things that they may be able to add to what they currently do to help them. And I imagine that's something that you talked about already in terms of seeking other avenues to be able to develop and improve. Yeah, no question. You know, a specific example too, I think for me, when I reflect on kind of keeping it simple and, and trusting what you already know was, and this was a sports psych, Dr. Craig Manning is one of the leading sports psychologists in the world, helped me with, I read his book, the book's called The Fearless Mind. And, and one of the things I was struggling with when we were at the division two level was as the season would progress, you know, you watch a lot of film and I would like out of admiration, I would be watching film and, and watch what other people are doing and, and kind of caught myself condemning our own system and like, man, we don't have enough in, we're too simple, we're not complex enough, we're easy to scout. And kind of started to get down on myself at the most important time of the season because a lot of the time, much of the time that I was doing that, it was right before March. And one of the things that, that Dr. Craig Manning helped me with was yeah, there's all these areas that you want to keep trying to, to build upon and you want to keep growing and have a growth mindset and add things to your game, but what can you remove? And what do you need to discard? What do you need to get rid of? What's holding you back? And for me, that was one of the things that I had to really get rid of was, you know, we'd spent the entire year trying to get our guys to play with confidence and play on their front foot, play with great energy on the defensive end of the floor, and then have that transfer to offense and you know, we had this team that was fighting for each other. And here I was watching film, thinking about all these things that we didn't do. And that wasn't putting us in the best position possible. And it wasn't making me the best version of myself as a leader. So I had to really get rid of that. And, you know, it was a pretty simple activity. I just started writing down kind of on paper, all the things that I was insecure about as we were heading into March and kind of, Hey, these are the things that I'm going to get rid of. And that really helped me in our last year of division two. And we've kind of been knocking on the door of winning the, the regional tournament. We were, I thought a little bit better each of our four previous seasons, but in our fifth year, we were final, finally able to win uh, the West region championship. And obviously you got to have guys make a ton of plays, but you know, you reflect on your own leadership. For me, I had the most clear mind and heart that I had competed with in five years for sure. And that definitely, I would attribute that clear mind and heart to that activity of just trying to get rid of that stuff. So instead of watching film and picking our own game apart to our detriment, really relying and believing in what we were doing as we headed into the most important part of the season. Great point in terms of dropping the negative stuff or removing stuff. And, you know, it's an old Don Meyer quote, which I'm sure many coaches have heard. When you add, you must subtract. And you can't keep doing it all in that type of mindset. And I've gone even further with this, and I'd love to hear your input on this. I think coaches don't think about that enough in terms of supporting their players' skill development. We always think about skill development as the addition of something. And I constantly want to phrase it to players, especially the players that at the level you're dealing with, as the removal of something. Where can you remove a dribble and be more efficient and effective? Where can you remove a pass and be more efficient and effective? I imagine you're talking about that with, to your players as well. Yeah, absolutely. And that's we really focus on that when we're watching film is how can we be more efficient defensively? 
Obviously, on the offensive side of the ball, there are, are so many metrics now available to everyone in terms of efficiency. But I agree in terms of skill development, really playing to your strengths once you get to the season and getting guys to understand that that doesn't mean you don't believe in them. And then when we get to the spring, let's try and add things. But when we get into the competition part of the year, starting in October with the two preseason scrimmages that were allowed, is let's get out of our own way. And let's tour with our strengths, wherever that may be with in our career. And we try and point out examples of guys in our program that have done that, that maybe as a freshman and sophomore, they were, it was all about getting to their jump hook and getting to that spot on that floor where they could be really efficient. And then by their junior year, maybe they were shooting more shots off the dribble or extending their range and shooting the three. But I think so many times now with player development, things can progress in the off season. And, and sometimes they spill into the season to the player's detriment to where they're not playing to their strengths. And I think that's always the fascinating part when, when you watch NBA basketball and you have a chance to, to get to a game, which is hard to do in the middle of a college season, but the efficiency with which those guys are, are utilizing their skills. You know, I went up and watched the Milwaukee bucks at kind of a player led training camp. And I share this with our guys all the time, but there were about 15 guys in the gym and it was, it was at a, a local high school in Santa Barbara. And out of 15 guys that ended up playing in the open gym, there were probably only four guys out of those 15 that took more than three or four dribbles at one time. And the rest of them were shooting the ball off the catch or they were bouncing at one time and moving it on or getting to their spot where they could felt like they could knock a shot down. So, you know, we would try and get our guys to understand that, yeah, we believe in you, but we want you to play to your strengths so you can compete at the level that you really desire to. The other thing that it builds to is this this concept that I've I've saw in your some of your clinic notes and stuff and this potential in training. This is where interference equals performance. Can you explain that? Because I like the phrasing of how you approach this. Yeah, it's it's something you know that that we've stolen. Most of our stuff is, and we just keep trying to learn from others. But and we try and we try and take things that we think are applicable to our culture. But it's a Dr. Craig Manning concept and the potential plus training equals performance, high performance, but potential plus training minus interference equals maximum performance. And, you know, throughout the journey, I think no matter where you're coaching, no matter what level you're coaching at, there's going to be some interference in the midst of a journey because it's such a long season. I'm married into a football family and, and I love football, but that is a, a quick journey. I mean, it, it happens fast. The, the training into the competition and 12 weeks later, boom, you're, you're either in a position to compete for a championship or, or it's over. And our thing really starts in September when the guys get back to school and hopefully you can play deep into March. And in the midst of that, there's a lot of disappointment and there's a lot of expectations. And, and sometimes there's a lot of interference that's created. and it's not the potential. It's, it's not the training. Those things are there. It's the interference that gets in the way of, of your team really performing at its highest level. And we try and get to that. And we try and be in tune with our guys and help them through that. You know, I think we all experience interference. And, you know, I spoke to earlier some of the interference that I was running on myself as a leader. And I think no matter how how well you team build in the fall. And I think a lot of people focus on team building in the fall with retreats or breakaway trips and things like that. And it's, and sometimes we forget to come back to it. I think no matter how well you team build in the fall, the reality of it is you've got to stay with it the whole year because interference is something that's very real. So we try and address it. We try and get to it. We try and be very honest and open about it and deal with expectations that maybe an individual player is struggling with something, or maybe we're struggling with something with a team. Maybe we put forward very lofty goals, and maybe in the first lap, the second lap, or the third lap, we're really, it doesn't look like we're in a position to achieve those goals. So how is everyone dealing with that mentally? And how do we go about getting ourselves in a good place so that we can continue attacking? We're going to get into more of the, kind of specific things you do. And one of them is this, this concept of explaining to your players what's a false notion 
and really countering that, right? Like as a coach, we counter defenses or we counter offenses, but you're countering some of these false notions that players have. Can you give us an example of this? Because again, great phrasing and such an important thing in terms of this ongoing process of team building that is not, as you said, just one time retreat at the beginning of the year. Yeah, I think, you know, we, we talk a lot about, you know, clarity of culture. And I think one of the things that, that you have to cut through is I think a lot of players grow up believing, and I think it's almost innate, but they grow up believing that everyone's going to be coached the same. And I think if you really, were to really ask them and vet the question, they would even probably oppose their first instinct. But we get to it, you know, and we, we really explain on the front end that, yeah, we're, everyone in our program is very different. And we're going to coach every guy differently. For With some guys, maybe we, we're going to watch five, six, seven hours of film with them individually every week. With other guys, we may feel that watching film with them individually sets them back and, you know, takes them out of, out of the headspace they need to be in to compete at their best. Or, you know, with, with some guys, we may coach them really hard with other guys that may be pulling them into an individual meeting setting and explaining to them what they need to do better. And I think if guys can trust that we're trying to get the best out of everybody and really trust that, and that we're trying to coach each guy to be the best version of themselves so that our team can achieve at the highest level, I think you got a great chance to move forward with your team and and eliminate some of that interference. I think some of the some of the most basic interference that's typically present is when guys on your team are measuring out of frustration how another guy is getting coached versus how he's getting coached. And again, the, the, our basic approach to that is is to get right to it and, and continue to come back to and remind them, yeah, you guys are different. We're different as coaches. We're different leaders. Every guy on our coaching staff has a leadership role and we're all, all going to lead you guys differently. So I think that's really important. And I think the other thing that we try and get to is there's a big difference between agreement and understanding. And, you know, we're coaching men and these guys are, they need to have their own opinions. And these guys have great minds when it comes to the game, but there's no possible way we're going to agree on everything. But the goal is that we understand each other. And there's a huge difference between agreement and understanding that ultimately successful communication is about reaching a place of understanding about how we're trying to go forward as a team and really go for it and eliminate the interference so that we can really strive. So we talk about those things a lot. And then we also try and just define basic things that, that I think everyone in some respects just thinks everyone should know. And and I don't think all the time, guys, if you ask them, hey, define what being coachable means, you know, so we try and define that. For us, it's it's eye contact, it's uh, verbal or physical assent, you know, a guy giving you a head nod, coach, I got you. And then third is an honest effort to execute what you just asked them to do. And, and we, we keep coming back to that because ultimately the teams that really excel are the ones that can remain really, really coachable throughout because you're going to get in tough situations. There's going to be hard film sessions. You might lose a tough road game. You might, you might get, you might get hit at home in front of a great crowd. And ultimately everyone's got to remain coachable. So we try and get to what that looks like. And, you know, so we believe in that stuff, just continuing to build clarity of culture. It's great stuff. I love the difference between agreement and understanding. Just tremendous way to be able to phrase it to young people again, that you want to encourage them to have thinking different than yours. But at some point, there has to be an understanding that this is the way we're doing it. I'm wondering where those conversations happen. Is this a, initially a group conversation, but then they become more individual? Or how are you getting this information across to your players? Yeah, I think all different settings. And, you know, we always say meetings without meetings. I mean, we don't. We set meetings in our program, but we also, I mean, our communication is throughout. It might, it might be in the weight room. It might be in the locker room. It might be on the floor, you know, take uh, something I think in coaching that's difficult, like shot selection. We try and create a, a basic definition for shot selection. And that is that a good shot for our team is when, if the guy who's shooting the ball, the other four guys on the floor 
they know he's going to take the shot. And, and we have good rebound position and coverage and everyone's expecting that player to shoot that ball. And, and that's different for every player. And so we may point that out in, in a team setting, in a very competitive situation. We may stop it and say, look, hey, I want everyone to understand that's not a great shot for everyone, but we're expecting Farron Flavors to shoot that ball because he's got extended range. And, and that's the best version of our team is if he shoots that ball with a free mind from 23 feet. And we may point out explicitly that, hey, uh, another guy on our team, we want you 10 toes on the line and we don't want anyone around you. We want you to be wide open when you shoot that three. So I think sometimes the guys appreciate just the ability to get right to that and the honesty. And those aren't always easy conversations when it comes to shot selection, but I would think for a lot of coaches, that's one of those things, you know, you talk about coaching defense and rebounding and then turnovers and, and shot selection, some of the hardest things to get to. And, and that's where the coachability and the trust and the understanding can come into play and really show up in the data. So much practical stuff already, coach. I mean, it's so much good stuff, but I know that uh, I want to do some quick hits with you because I know you have some concepts that I want to get through because that's been the incredible value of this podcast for coaches is that coaches like you sharing stuff that coaches can actually go use immediately. It's not theoretical, it's practical. So coach, you do so many practical things. One of the really practical things I love is that you go out of your way to create speaking opportunities for your players. It's great that you asked that question. There was something that happened last night in our program that kind of speaks volumes about that concept. It, after our games, we really try and build a a tie to our, our community support and, and our student section. So they'll interview our players, uh, our certain player, after each game over the PA system. The broadcast on the scoreboard's become a really neat thing you know, at the event center. And we competed last night against Chicago State. One of our seniors was selected to speak and he killed it. I mean, he couldn't have done a better job with his public speaking. But in that minute and a half, he said, and our guys were out there watching him and he said one thing where he kind of misspoke and the guys, you know, were teasing him. And, you know, you got to have that. You got to be able to laugh. And Popovich talks about that all the time, that you got to have a a locker room full of guys that have gotten over themselves and, and can laugh at themselves. And, and we believe in that too, but it was funny because it was it was kind of a poignant moment in regards to what we talk about in our program as we as we're developing leadership within our guys is that one of our concept is when you when you're forced to speak publicly, you go from being a critic to a leader. And I think it's it's so easy to, you know, as a player, you know, head coaches or assistant coaches, they're they're talking so much in front of the team and instead of focusing on the, on all the great communication, you know, we pick apart some of the things that maybe they wish they could take back or, you know, the one or two things that are maybe a little bit off track. And so we try to get our guys to appreciate leadership from that perspective. And throughout the year, whether it's at our basketball camps, uh, we put our guys in positions to speak all the time. We believe that that builds leadership. It challenges them to be bold, to prepare, uh, to even like like last night when a when a guy does such a great job is is to uh, evaluate yeah I put myself out there I'm I'm not afraid to be up in front of people um, leadership is about putting yourself out there and not not being fearful of saying one wrong thing or, or something like that so that's been a really good thing for us the other thing we do is a, a senior speaker series where we um, however many seniors we have we correlate that to our last set of games. So if we have five seniors in our last five conference games, we'll have those seniors get up in front of the team and, and they, they carry the pregame messaging for that day. And they, they talk about, you know, what the program means to them and, and how we want to go about competing as a program. And I think those, those leadership opportunities, those, those opportunities to speak publicly are, are invaluable to building leadership. No, I love that. And obviously, it creates empathy for you as well as a coach that they understand what you go through all the time in terms of public speaking and, uh, you know, representing the program. So that's got to be part of it as well. Yeah. And I think they're, you know, they're watching the NBA and there's so much stuff on social media now where, you know, if, if you say one wrong thing, 
it can get picked apart. And, and sometimes that can build up fear uh, within young leaders where, you know, people are, are less inclined to put themselves out there. And I, and I do think, you know, we've done so much now for young people in, ter- in terms of organization. You know, I mean, my son and my daughter both compete in youth sports. My daughter's in high school now. So, you know, things are organized at the high school level. But for my son, you know, I, I think about how many pickup games I had played in where, you know, we had to pick the teams or we had to call buddies and get them to the park. And that's leadership. And now, you know, we're very critical of of young people and their leadership, but we do so much for them now, they don't have as many opportunities to grow within that. So I think you have to really be pretty intentional if you want leadership development to be an integral part of your program, it has to be intentional. Absolutely has to be intentional. And you're absolutely right too, that we blame kids sometimes for not being able to self-organize and do some of these leadership things. But as adults, we're the ones that took it away from them. So we're the ones that have to give it back to them. So I love that you've made that connection as well. Yeah, for sure. For sure. It's an interesting thing because I think when these guys have these opportunities, they thrive. I mean, I, I look at our basketball camps in the summer. I mean, these guys could run the camp themselves. I mean, they're, they're so good at teaching the game and, and sharing what they know. And, and that's, that's what it's about is, uh, you know, having a chance to, the games have such an impact on us is, is to be able to, to use that knowledge and that information and your experiences to, to positively impact somebody else. So, we try and create as many of those opportunities as we can throughout the year. You've talked about a little bit, the fearless mind. You've talked about the sports psych and different things that come into your program. And another thing you talk about losing poise, balance between aggression and poise. But part of that is players have to have a game plan for managing that. Can you talk a little bit about the game plan that you try and present to them? Yeah. You know, we're, we're striving for balance there, you know, with, with, aggression and poise. And I think every player's a little bit different, you know, for some players, they compete better when they are a little bit on edge for other, for other competitors, maybe, maybe they're at their best when, um, you know, they're at peace and that's, that's a journey with each guy to figure out what headspace they want to compete in. I think sometimes that, that takes a while. And when this race has run really well, it's, um, you're still figuring those things out. You know, maybe you don't even have them figured out by their sophomore or junior year. We, we want our guys to finish at their best. But we talk all the time about, you know, there's a big difference between blowing off steam and being poisonous, you know, because we want to have a, a program that competes with great energy and enthusiasm. And we don't want to be, we don't want to focus so much on poise that, that we lose our moxie or our edge. And, but we try and identify in practice, like, are you blowing off steam or are you drawing attention to yourself and it's actually becoming poisonous to our culture? So it's one of those things we're trying to coach in the moment, you know, and, and you self-reflect, you, you think about your own leadership journey. So I know myself as, as a young head coach, one of my strengths was my intensity, but it was also something that could be taught to my team if I didn't keep track of it. And it's, you know, I think it's a journey for all of us as coaches is, to compete at the highest level, there is a great deal of intensity required and there's pressure and there's expectations and, and you've got to balance all that stuff and, and really find the best place to compete in while still being yourself. And, you know, I think that's something that to this day, you know, I'm, I'm still finding the balance within and, and you try and share that with your guys from a, from a place of empathy and humility that it's a journey. It's a journey on that front. You know, you, you can't, you can't try and be somebody else. You, you just got to work towards being the best version of yourself, but you got to understand that you can't just say, Hey, this is who I am. If I'm hurting the team or if you're being poisonous to yourself or the team. So it's something that we believe in coaching and we try and create a temperature and practice where that's exposed, you know, and, and that goes back to, again, like we talked about earlier, I think trust in what you know and, and kind of how you came up in the game. I go back to how I was coached in high school. The scoreboard was up and we kept scoring everything we did. And in every drill and every every minute of practice, you were trying to make 
you know, in high school for us, it was red and gold and you were trying to make red or, or gold win. And that's all it was about. It wasn't about your stats or anything like that. It was simply like, could you make the other four guys around you better? And, and so we try and put a huge focus on that while the temperature being turned up. Speaking of getting better, another concept, what is an excellence hall? Well, excellence hall for us is something, you know, again, I keep talking about going back to our roots that, that we started with at Citrus. You know, when you're coaching junior college, you're wearing a lot of, of different hats. You're serving a lot of different roles. We, we were very blessed at Citrus to have a great academic counselor, but oftentimes, you know, you're, you're in that hall, you're handling all the matriculation and the recruiting at the same time you're recruiting for your own program. Guys are, are trying to figure out, maybe, maybe they came to you with some struggles academically out of high school. Everyone, you know, has a different journey and a different story as to how they got to where, where they're at, but you've got to help them matriculate and find a winning path. And for us at Citrus, it was, we had the intention of, we thought we would every guy individually each week was really important to find out what was going on in their lives, to talk a lot about goal setting, to help them in those areas. And what we found was it sounded good, but the basketball always seemed to, to take over. And by the time we got to the competition or really into the heart of practice in October, you know, that that time was reserved for a film or extra shooting or, or lifting and, and we weren't getting to those meetings and we weren't in tune with our guys so that we could really help them in the areas that I think mattered most in their lives. So we started to set Wednesday aside and we, instead of it being a study hall, it was an excellence hall. And we talked a lot more about life building skills than we did academic skills, even though we told letters to, to people that had helped us get to where we're at, working on our appreciation, how to create a to-do list, keeping a calendar things that we think um, winning people do and people that are really successful and people of excellence. And then we started bringing in guest speakers from all different arenas and realms professionally to speak truth into these guys' lives. And it was just something that was really powerful for our guys. And I think it meant a lot to them, for them to, to know that their coaches were willing to take a day off the basketball floor to sacrifice basketball to talk to them about things that, that really mattered. And, and we've tried to bring that forward with us. You know, it gets harder and harder as you dig into conference play to get it done each week. And it also gives you a chance to get off the floor and get your bodies right. So it's been a really, really good thing for us. It continues to evolve. We've had some great speakers over the years that, that have impacted our guys at a high level. And, and we've had days that in excellence all that I think are some of our best days of the year. Well, it's such a great idea and so many great ideas in terms of the things that you've shared, Coach. And I can't thank you enough for taking the time and for coaches that don't know what you're doing and what you're putting together down there. Um, it's just tremendous. So I, I look forward to more coaches finding out about how great a job you're doing. I appreciate the opportunity to share and, and appreciate the podcast. It helps so many of us. To find out more about Coach and all we spoke about today, please take a look at the show notes for today's episode. I love to share the game and have basketball coaching conversations, so connect with me on social media. You can find all my social media information and all your membership clinic and consulting needs at basketballimmersion.com. That concludes today's episode. I know there are so many podcasts out there. Thank you for taking the time to listen to the basketball podcast with me, your host, Chris Oliver. Please subscribe and share the podcast with your friends and colleagues so that we can keep bringing you the best of what's out there and share the game.